Well, good evening. Or maybe good afternoon. After the time changes and we have so much daylight, and uh, as the days are continuing to lengthen like they are, uh, it seems like afternoon, not evening, but we enjoy this time of year. However, I hear things are going to change. Good to have you. We are thankful for the presence of each of you um, on our Wednesday nights. The time of year um, makes it a little more pleasant to be outside, that's for sure. And uh, hopefully you get to use some of that while we go through the transitional period. We have some cool and wet and things of that sort, but we enjoy the changing in the seasons. It's a marvelous thing. Um, we just walk outside one day and it's just not cold anymore. It's warm. That's, that's always uh, interesting. It doesn't catch me by surprise because I know it's coming. But it's always a, a pleasant change when you just walk out and it's like, okay, it's different. Um, and that's neat. We don't have any sick folks that I'm going to tell you about to start with. We'll have the announcements later toward the, the uh, end of our time together. And they'll tell us, update us on all the people we need to know about. Um, our activities for our young people with Latch to Leaders is in full swing. Uh, that will take place next Thursday. All the youngins will be heading off to Nashville and some older folks riding herd on them. And uh, by the following Sunday, it'll all be wrapped up and um, be a good, good time for all of those who are participating. We'll be doing our study from 1 Timothy chapter 6 tonight, if you'd like to turn there. It's where we'll begin, and uh, we'll start that in just a minute. Let's go to God in prayer, then we'll do our study. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blessings of the day. Father, we thank you for life. We thank you for every gift of life. Father, for blessings that we don't know that we've been blessed with, but that are in our hands and in our lives. Father, we thank you for the church at Maysville. We ask your blessings on each and every one of our members, on those who lead and serve and are involved in any way. We ask your blessings on our young people. We pray that they will learn the lessons well of youth, the things that they should take with them into adulthood, that they will grow up to be servants of yours, that they will be faithful in their lives. And Father, whatever influence that we may have, those of us who are older, help us to do say and exert that influence as appropriately and as effectively as we can. Father, we thank you for your son Jesus, for the forgiveness of our sins. We thank you for the beautiful world that we live in, the hope of eternal life, and the challenge, Father, that, that we live in two worlds. We pray that you will help us to remember that this world is not our home and that we look forward to another. Father, go with us through the night. We ask your blessings on those of our members who have special needs that you will watch over and provide for them. We ask that you will continue to help those who have, have sickness, who have injury, that they will continue to recover and be brought back to us soon. Watch over them, Father, and help us to serve as we are able and as we see opportunity. Father, go with us through the night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in the middle of spring break so that there's still some of our folks out of pocket and traveling, but we're glad that you're with us tonight. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, the end of verse 2 is where we left off last week, and Paul comes back and says, teach and exhort these things, teaching. That was the very first topic that Paul brought up as he spoke with Timothy. Now, when we covered those verses back in 1 Timothy chapter 1 uh, several uh, weeks ago. Um, those weren't the only thoughts on our mind. We were just beginning. But that's what Paul commissioned Timothy to do. Back to 1 Timothy 1.3. As I urged you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. 
nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes rather than godly edification which is in the faith. Not only was Timothy sent to Ephesus to teach, but there were other people teaching there already. They were involved in um, one of two things, perhaps, either teaching the wrong things or improperly teaching the right things. But they were involved with stuff they shouldn't be. Paul says, I want you to counter it. I want you to teach because these are teaching wrongly. We come across teaching again as one of Paul's emphasis in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Uh, where in the second verse, as Paul is giving instruction to uh, provide the church guidelines in terms of those who will serve as elders over a local congregation, included in that list of qualities that they must have, he says that they need to be able to teach. Last part of verse 2. It seems almost needless to say, but it is necessary to say, that those who would serve as the church's leaders, who would guide and watch over the flock, should themselves be teachers. And Paul said that was one of the qualities they should have. They should be teachers. How can you be an influence to others if you do not teach? If you're not qualified to teach? How can you teach what you don't know? From a personal standpoint, and that's all this is, right? The statement I'm about to make is personal. I believe that one of the greatest single areas of harm that has been brought on the Lord's church was by the selection of men to serve as elders who themselves did not know the book. And because they did not have a, a good understanding of God's will, they themselves were not truly um, grounded to the point that they were able to pass it on to others. They then could not stand when pressures uh, were brought against them. They did not have a good perspective of, of spiritual things as opposed to physical. And I think it represents a great deal of trouble uh, that many churches have, uh, have dealt with. If you have a leadership that is founded solidly on the Scriptures, they know it, they understand it, they comprehend uh, what the Bible teaches. They are not easily pushed into error. They'll have good perspective on the things that are really important in the church. Uh, those things that, uh, that need to be done, those that don't need to be done. Uh, hopefully a value on souls and uh, evangelism and spreading the gospel and reaching out in our community, both wherever we are and, and far away. And many, many other things come up in that regard. If you can't or if you don't teach, though, then there's so much that's missed out on. Anyone who has ever taught a class of any kind, anywhere, who gets the most out of the class? The teacher does. Why? Because you're going to study hours and hours of material that you may not get an opportunity to present, but you still are immersed in that. Teach those who are teaching improperly. Hush them up. Elders ought to be teachers. Paul comes back where we started our class just now. Teach and exhort these things. Now, what was it that Paul was specifically having in mind here? I don't think it is uh, just the uh, discussion of bond servants that he's just finished up. Although, certainly that needs to be taught. What Paul said there regarding uh, slaves, that needed to have been taught. And he, they shouldn't be quiet about it. But everything else is also included. Everything that's in 1 Timothy would, uh, would fall under that category. Teach these things. And I think it is, again, self-evident that it is, it is not enough just to know what is right and what God wants. 
um, we also have to pass that information on to others. It's about time for yard work. If you'd like yard work, good for you. If you don't, I'm sorry. Uh, there's a certain amount of yard work you're probably going to have to do anyway, although you can always hire it done. Um, I don't mind the occasional dandelion in my yard. It doesn't bother me a bit to see the little green leaves there in their little shape. I do not mind occasionally a little yellow flower being there. But do you know what the problem is with a stinking dandelion and that little yellow flower? There's also going to come up another thing, and it'll come up overnight. It'll come up in one day. It'll send up a stolen, and on the top of it will be a little bud, and when it opens up, it's going to have 900,000 little seeds. Okay, probably not that many, but I don't know how many. Uh, someone of you who are attached to the Internet right now, and probably on Facebook, Google that and find out how many dandelion seeds are on one of those little pods. Don't tell me you're not doing it. I know you're on the, on the internet. Anyway, uh, I don't know how many there are, but, but when the wind comes and they blow, those things go everywhere. And everywhere they go, they, they want to make another dandelion. And then if you have, you know, one of those come up and it spreads, you know, a gazillion seeds out there. And then you have a gazillion of them out there. And before long, it takes over the whole yard. It's not a problem of one dandelion. If they'd keep it to themselves, I'd be okay. Why aren't Christians like that? We shouldn't keep things to ourselves. We should be teachers. We should be influential on others. Paul said, Timothy, it's not enough that you know. It's not enough that you believe. You need to influence others. Be a teacher. Teach these things. Teach the church. Teach the young. Teach the world. Then he goes on, verse 3. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain from such withdraw yourselves. Who did Paul have in mind? Is this a hypothetical list or was there a target audience here? Did Paul have a group in mind that needed specifically uh, to be countered by Timothy? Or was he just recognizing that there was a category of people uh, that might rise up? I don't know of a specific threat. I can't tell you what was taking place in the church in Ephesus that Paul wanted Timothy to deal with. But Paul knew this was what Timothy needed to, uh, uh, to hear. Anyone who teaches otherwise. That's an interesting Greek word. Greek is an interesting language. I wish I knew it better than I do. But the, uh, the word that is translated here, uh, teach otherwise, Heterodidaskalia. Literally, one who teaches something else. Not the same. That would be homo. This is hetero. Different. Someone who teaches something different. Different from what? Different from what they should be teaching. There obviously was an, an approved path, and then there was that which was other than the approved path. And Paul will identify several things uh, of those who are on the approved path and those who aren't. Those who aren't, they do not consent to wholesome words. Or some of you have sound words or sound doctrine. They don't consent to those things that are sound, that are true. Now, how do we evaluate truth? Wow. We live in an interesting world. There are a couple of sermons that I'm wrestling with. And I say that in the uh, most literal terms, obviously still figuratively. But they're, they're an open, going, an ongoing file on my desk that I keep adding notes to. I'm not ready to preach them yet. I've mentioned one of them before. And I'm still working on that 
sermon, and I need to do another one on postmodernism. And as soon as I say the word, your eyes are going to roll back in your head and you're going to go to sleep. And so I'm figuring out how to, trying to figure out how to make that a topic that you want to hear because we need to talk about it. The concepts behind it are we live in a period in which, in general, lots of folks have decided they don't want to know what is true. They don't care what is true. In fact, there isn't even a need to pursue what is true because we're not going to be able to agree on what's true. The whole concept of what's described as the emerging church um, is, is pushing off of that and is sucking in young people uh, with vague notions and vague ideas. What they are not doing is telling the words of Jesus solidly, concretely, so that they can be clearly understood and applied to life. They don't want that. And Paul says these people don't want that. They don't consent to those things that are wholesome. And then he goes on specifically, the things that are from Jesus. The words of Jesus are wholesome. They are sound. The words of, of the Lord Jesus to the doctrines which accord with godliness. They're not interested in godliness. They're pursuing something else. What, what is their, their agenda? Then he goes on to describe them as... This person that he has in mind, hypothetically I'm assuming, is proud, but knowing nothing. Proud. The, the word that is translated here, proud, is sometimes translated puffed up. Ever, ever, you ever been to a... a pond and seen a, a big old bullfrog you watch them make their noise you hear those croakings and if you find them you'll see them and they 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 puff up paul has several things to say about puffed up in first corinthians i want to go and read some of them starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. One. Four one. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by human court in fact, I do not even judge myself, for I know nothing, excuse me, for I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will, bring, uh, will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the, hearts of, of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. Now these things, brethren, I have figuratively transferred to myself and Apollos for your sakes, that you may learn in us not to think beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up on behalf of one against the other. For who makes you differ from another? And what do you have that you did not receive? Now, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as if you had not received it? Why are people puffed up? What puffs us up? What makes us proud? What gives us a right to be arrogant or to be boastful of something? Um, maybe it's what we can do, our abilities. Maybe it is our accomplishments. Look at my education. Look at my job. Look at my career. Maybe it's the people we hang out with. Look who my friends list is. Look who I have access to. Or maybe it's how much money we have, or what we drive, or how we dress, or where we've gone on vacation, or whatever. People can be puffed up about lots of things. But then Paul uses this and he says, how is it that you're puffed up about anything? What do you have that you weren't given? I 
we spend a lot of money as Americans on quote unquote beauty products. And uh, girls are not the, ladies are not the only ones who spend money on beauty products. Isn't that right, guys? We may not have the same kind or appeal in every way, but uh, there's an interest in us in, in making ourselves look good. And when you've made yourself look as good as you can, and we don't all, all look the same, how is it that you came to look the way you do? You didn't have anything to do with how you look, good or bad. If you don't like how you look, not a lot you can do about it. Oh, you, there are some folks who spend a whole bunch of money on plastic surgery, and they will make an adjustment to uh, a few things here and there. But you didn't have any control over it. And so when we brag, I look good and you don't, you didn't have anything to do with that. It just happened. And so for one person to look down on another, you're in exactly the same spot. You just had a different draw. The abilities that you have. You brag about your abilities. Who gave them to you? God did. And so what you're bragging on is the lot that you were given. It's not like it's something that you did. Well, I've, I've gone and done my education. I've done this. I've done that. Yes, with opportunities that were afforded to you and with help that other people did. And, and uh, there were a lot of things that went into almost everything that we are and have. How is it that we brag? And Paul, looking at himself, he, he told the church in Corinth, I'm applying this to me and Apollos because there was a problem in Corinth because uh, the folks saw that there was a difference. Apollos is described in Scripture as an eloquent man. Eloquent. You know what that means? Someone who is, who is an artist with their words. Paul says, I was rough of speech I showed up, and I was nervous, and I didn't speak with wisdom of men. I just spoke the common, everyday message of Jesus so that your belief and power would be in Jesus and not in me. Paul says, I didn't want you following after me. So then when the church begins to split, and they have some who say we're after Apollos, and some who say we're after Paul, and some who say we're after Cephas, Paul says, forget that. You should all be following after Christ. That's it. Apollos, Peter, me, we're all doing the same work. We're all doing the same job. We are carrying forward the kingdom of God. So there's no purpose for anybody to be puffed up. We shouldn't be arrogant. One should not be above another. We're all going to be the same. No puffed up. Same chapter, a little farther down, verse 18. Now some are puffed up. As though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. And I will know not the words of those who are puffed up, but the power. Some in the church, apparently, were, were bragging about themselves. Whatever th thoughts they had, whatever power they thought they had, they looked down on Paul. Like, hey, what's Paul? We're better than Paul. And Paul says, I'm going to show up one of these days. And then we're going to see about power. Because he said, the Lord has given me power. What have you got? And we're going to even out some things here for those who are puffed up. Now, that's, that's not what we normally think of when we term, uh, think of uh, Paul nor the church in Corinth. All right. Chapter 8, verse 1. Now concerning the things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Another problem with that, that puffed up thing is people who are, are knowledgeable, who are intelligent, who have, have education, sometimes become arrogant. Not people are arrogant without education. But knowledge puffs up. These who were, that Paul was addressing uh, himself to Timothy to, um, he said they were puffed up. They, they were proud. They were teaching things. And they shouldn't have been. Go a couple of more chapters over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Fourth verse. 
Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love is not arrogant. Love does not boast. So if people are boasting and they're proud and they're arrogant, then they're missing something. There's, there's a gap there. Those who are teaching and they're proud and they've turned away from God and they're doing things that they shouldn't do, they're, they're missing this love for God. These self-teachers, knowing nothing. Now, there's quite a little list here, and I don't really have time to go through the whole list in great detail. Proud, knowing nothing. Now, that's not a literal term, knowing nothing. Obviously, they know something. Paul's using it in a figurative way. They don't know what they really need to know. Or they don't know as good as they think they know. Go back again to chapter 1, verse 5. Now the purpose of a commandment of the commandment is love from a pure heart from a good conscience from sincere faith which some having strayed have turned aside to idle talk desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm Put that in your own language These people want to be seen as teachers Paul says they don't know what they're talking about There's a challenge to teaching. There's a challenge to being students. Who are you going to listen to? There are probably 50 uh, religious broadcasts on the radio or internet or television right now that you can tune in. You could listen to them. What are they going to say? What are they holding to? What are their beliefs? What do they teach? You're responsible for what you listen to. Be careful how you hear. That's what Jesus said. Take heed how you hear. Because there are people out there who want to tell you things. And it doesn't matter where they are. It doesn't matter if there's a person standing here or a person standing there or a person standing somewhere else in a classroom somewhere. Everything has to be brought back to, is it right with God? Does the Bible teach these things? Because there are people who will teach you things that don't come from Scripture. There are those who will teach their own things and their own ideas. And Paul said they're out there. He's proud, knowing nothing. He is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words from which come envy, strife, reveling, evil suspicions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. What a list. There are people who love arguments who love wrestling with ideas. And the, when you get through wrestling, it doesn't make any difference. All you did was just argue. There's no point to it. Don't get involved. And Paul, at least three times in the book of 1 Timothy, tells Timothy, stay away from people who just want to argue. Just leave them alone. In fact, Paul's final statement there in verse 5, from such withdraw yourself. Get away from them. Hopefully you'll find good teachers. Stay away from those who aren't. That last phrase in verse 5, they suppose that godliness is a means of gain. That's the connection to the next verse. There are people who see religion as an opportunity for wealth for themselves. I'm not going to call any names. But there are some very well-known personalities who are on television, and they brag about their mansions and their, royal, their Rolls Royce cars and their Rolex watches and their personal jets and all of the money that they have available to them. And they say, God has given it to me because I'm such a faithful servant. And if you want to be a faithful servant too, you give me your money. And I'll get a bigger jet and a bigger house. Oh, and by the way, God will give you all that stuff too. 
not. And all they're doing is fleecing the people. One very popular, at the time, uh, television personality, a number of years ago said, if I don't raise X amount of money, God said he's going to kill me. Oh, please. What people sent in the money. Some use godliness as a means of gain. I had a very... Um, I guess he was a skeptic, would be the best way to describe it. At least he was very jaded. He said, if I had no conscience and I was interested in just making money off of silly people, I'd just start a church. Well, uh, that's been done before. But then Paul takes that thought, some see godliness as a means of getting, and he goes into the next discussion. Now godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And with verse 6 of 1 Timothy chapter 6, we start one of the most interesting and thought-provoking discussions of material wealth and human beings that is in Scripture. We will not finish it tonight. I hope next week, Lord willing, we will spend some more time here. Not that we're done, but um, there, uh, there's, there's simply more here than I can talk about, and I want to spend some time discussing this, and I don't want to get in a hurry. Before we read all of this discussion, I want you to read with me another passage. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 4. Let's start reading with verse 3. Listen, Jesus says. Behold, a sower went out to sow. And it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth. And immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched. And because it had no root, it withered away. And some seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop that sprang up, increased, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now when he was alone, verse 10 says, one of the disciples said, Tell us what this parable means. And Jesus has some words regarding that. And then he begins to explain it in verse 13. And he said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves, and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now these are the ones sown among the thorns. They are the ones who hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things entering in choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. But these are the ones sown on good ground who accept, excuse me, who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. The greatest threat to people existentially in their lives, what their, their true existence is that they will not hear the word of God at all. And they have no hope of eternal life. But in the parable that Jesus tells here is the person goes out and sows the seed. And that is the work of evangelism. The work of missions. When the word is heard, when people hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's a choice to be made. Not all of them will accept it. Sometimes they don't understand it. Sometimes they understand it, but they don't want any part to do with it. And Jesus said, that's the concept of Satan coming and stealing it away. It's not going to find a place. And folks, Satan is hard at work in our world. 
He is helping people to not see. He is helping people to not hear. He is convincing them of other things so that they push Jesus and Christianity away. Even when they do hear the truth, they're not a, they're, they, don't, they don't accept it. It doesn't appeal to them. It's distasteful. Satan's arguments. Then there's that group who they believe. They, they, they accept the truth. They become believers. They're obedient. But there's a struggle. There's an internal struggle. They're not grounded. It really doesn't take root with them so that they are deep and holding on. And so when persecution arises, when troubles come up or issues, they quickly turn aside from truth and go on back into their, their way. We understand those two. People who don't hear, people who don't understand, don't want Christianity. Got it. People who become Christians, they truly are interested. They, they, they grab hold at the beginning and they want, but they're, they're, they just don't have a good hold. Their fingers aren't tight enough. The, the group around them is not strong enough. They don't get the support they need. Have you ever raised grass from seed? Oh, you've got to take care of it. You've got to make sure it doesn't get dry, that it gets shade, that it gets the proper water all the time. It, you have to baby it. Sometimes our new converts are thrown out on their own to deal with the world, and they don't always do well. I don't want to, but that's not my interest at this moment either. I'm interested in the next group. The group that hears the Word, and the Word grows, and they hold on to it, and they hold on to it for their whole life. But it doesn't do them any good. You know why? Because they're choked. Something else has got their passion. There's something else that they really care about. They're more interested in the world. They're more interested in money. They're more interested in things than they are in God. And they're never effective Christians. They're there. They're something. It's not my words. It's Jesus's. The cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke them out. There are a lot of good things in this world. There are a lot of things to be involved in. There are a lot of things that, that, that bring happiness. Um, there are things that we need to be involved with. Work and family and and uh, um, hobbies and, and time off and working in the yard and uh, doing lots of things. But any one of those things can also be an effective barrier to, your, to Christianity. They can choke you. We can become so involved with all of the good things in the world that we don't effectively do what God really wanted us to do. And that's the part that scares me as Christians in the United States of America. Because we're blessed. We have bounty. You live in a house that probably 80% of the world's population would cut off a major body part to have. You could just line them up. Okay, all you folks living in India, we'll give you this house... All you got to do is stick out your left arm. We're going to cut it off at the elbow. <clears throat> They'd be lined up as farther than you could see. We don't think of ourselves as rich. We don't think of ourselves as having uh, bounty. You talk about rich folks. Ah, that, I don't know who the rich folks are who live over in that neighborhood. Or the, the people who have those things. Oh, we are all rich. We have blessings more than most people in the world could imagine. There's not a person in this room that has gone hungry in a month. Now, you may have chosen not to eat. Or you may have had something come up where you didn't get to get your lunch on time and you had to wait three or four hours. Oh, I was hungry. I was starving. Malarkey. You don't know what the word starving means. The biggest problem you had deciding to come to church was which of the 500 garments you had hanging in your closet to wear. Which of 20 shoes you might put on. I didn't say they all look the same. But you've got them. 
And maybe you had to pick from one of several vehicles to drive. We are surrounded by the material things of the world. And it'll take us if we're not careful. Deceitfulness of riches. The appearance of something that has value. They're pursued by other people around us. You watch the fashion trends, something will pop up, and all of a sudden you'll see it. Boop, 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 boop. Everybody does it. Well, we get the same way. So they're driving this, they're buying that, they're going here, and and before long we're interested in in going and doing the same kinds of things. And Paul says, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we're carrying nothing out. If you haven't read the book of Ecclesiastes recently, let me offer you a little piece of homework before our class next Lord's Day, or next Wednesday night. Read the book of Ecclesiastes. All 12 chapters. Won't take you long. It's a good read. I want to read parts of it tonight. Chapter 1, starting in verse 3. What profit has a man from all his labor in which he toils under the sun? One generation passes away and another generation comes, but the earth abides forever. As far as the, uh, the writer here, Ecclesiastes from Solomon, Solomon says, I don't see any change. You keep having people come in, you have people go out, the world stays the same. Doesn't look like anything's changing. The sun also rises, verse 5. The sun goes down, hastens back to the place where it goes, where it, it, it arose. It's just the same. Day after day, it's all going on. It's just the same. Verse 12. I, the preacher, was king over Israel and Jerusalem. I set my heart to seek and search out by wisdom concerning all that is done under heaven. This burdensome task God has given to the sons of man by which they may be exercised. I've seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight. What is lacking cannot be numbered. I communed with my heart, saying, Look, I have attained greatness and have gained more wisdom than all who were before me in Jerusalem. My heart has understood great wisdom and knowledge. I have set my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive this also with grasping for the wind, for in much wisdom is much grief, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow." I said in my heart, come now, I will test you with mirth. Chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, enjoy pleasure, but surely this also was vanity. Verse 2, he comes up with laughter. Verse 3, I searched my heart how I might gratify my flesh with wine. Verse 4, I made great works and buildings. 5, I planted gardens and orchards. 6, I made water ponds to water everything. 7, I acquired male and female servants. Had them born great flocks. Eight, I gathered for myself silver and gold and the special treasures of kings. Verse 9, so I became great, excelled more than all who were before me in Jerusalem and still had my wisdom. Solomon says, I was the richest, wellest done man there was. Whatever I wanted to do, I did. Whatever I wanted to have, I got. Wow. Wow. Verse 10, whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I did not withhold my heart from any pleasure. My heart rejoiced in all my labor. This was the reward for all my labor. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had done and on all the labor in which I had toiled. And indeed, all was vanity and grasping for the wind. There was no profit under the sun. What? How how can you say that? What do you mean there's no profit? Keep reading into the next verses. I'm not going to. We don't have time. But when you do, here's what you're going to find. Solomon said, when I gathered all this and I had all my money and I had all my houses and I had all my servants and I had all my flocks and I had all this, he said, then I started counting my my years. And he said, okay, I'm 40, 50, 60, 70. You know what happens to people when they get that old? They get old and die. And Solomon says, I'm going to die too. In fact, that's one of the laments in the book of Ecclesiastes. I'm going to die. And he said, then who's going to get all this stuff? All of these material things I've gathered up, who's going to get them? I built, I arranged, I engineered, I, I, I planned, I did all this work. And now somebody else is going to have possession of those. And they didn't do it. They didn't work for it. But it's going to be theirs because I'm going to be gone. And Solomon said, what did I do all this for? 
why did I do all this work? He says, I was stupid. Didn't realize it. Spent all my time and all my effort trying to get together all of these physical things. And when I got it all together, you know what I realized? It doesn't really mean anything. It's just stuff. And it's going to go away. And I'm going to go away. And what was the point? And he says, I can't sleep at night because I'm worried about all of my stuff. And he said, but there's a laborer out here who's got a little house and a little, a little garden, and he goes off to work, and he comes home tired, and he goes to sleep, and he sleeps like a baby. And he's enjoying the world that God has given him, and I'm miserable. He said, it's vain. Solomon was deceived by riches. They choked him out. And that's what Jesus was warning against. And in the sermon on the, the, the parable of the, uh, the sower, that is the message we must learn. Don't worry about the seed that fell along the wayside. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the seed that had shallow, sh uh, shallow soil and quickly burned up. Don't worry about them. The one you need to worry about, the one we need to worry about, is that group that allowed the cares of this world and the riches to deceive them and choke out the word so that they were not fruitful. That's who we need to worry about because that's us. We're there. And if there is a risk to our lives as Christians, this represents one of those. I'm not really concerned that a whole bunch of you are going to suddenly rise up and be drug away into error. There's not someone going to start teaching you something about uh, some idea, crazy, wacko doctrine that you're going to get sucked off into. Chances are that's not going to happen. But a genuine threat to our well-being as we stand before God is to allow the things of this world to cause us to no longer really care about God and just go by day to day looking at these worldly things. We show up at church, we sing our songs, we go home and we enjoy, we count, we have fun with our stuff. Watch it. That's who God was warning us about right here. Next week, Lord willing, I'm going to pick up in the uh, seventh verse. I've got several little things I want to read to you besides Ecclesiastes. And we'll come back and talk about that a little more. Thank you for your time and attention.